thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, today we've got Chrissy Mail on the on the channel. So Chrissy is an amazing runner. Been running for a long time. She she got a dog in the background there called Petey. Um, so she's based in Bellingham in Washington, um, which is eight hour difference from where we are in Scotland. Uh, she's your Patagonia athlete, uh, Ultimate Direction. Coros athlete and um, work with the Conservation Alliance. Um, so you've ran lo loads of races, um, unbelievable amounts, uh, some of which have been Western States, Miwok, UTMB, Wasatch, uh, Leadville, Vermont, Hurt 100, Lake Sonoma, UTMF, Speed Goat. I could keep going on. So you, absolutely tons of races, loads of experience there. Uh, you've set course <laughs> records for the UTMB and Hard Rock. And you've run over 100 ultras, 155 female um, races, and two outright wins as well. So, wee bit of a. Oh, just a, that number's up over 65 now. Is it 65? Oh, awesome. Well it's done. It's over that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My research is all the information. It's, it's, not in, it's not as rapidly rising as it used to be, that number, but it's still, it goes up every little bit now. <laughs> oh, that's good. A win's a win. That's a, something I would never experience. Uh, that, that's, that's brilliant. They keep going up. So uh, 2000 Just was your first it. race uh, in chucking up, chucking up 50, wasn't it? And you went mm -hmm. back a couple of years later and you won it again. Um, in 2002, 2003, you raced uh, the very first edition of the UTMB and you managed to win it, which is amazing. That must have been such a, an amazing feeling. Um, 2005, you became the youngest woman to complete the Grand Slam of ultra running. Uh, 2007, set the women's record for hard rock. Uh, 2009, went back to UTMB and won it again, which is brilliant. Um, 2012, you did Western States, Hard Rock, and UTMB Triple. Uh, 2015, just moving on a wee bit further, 2015, you published your first, first book um, called Running Your First Ultra, which the second edition is out now. And if anyone wants to get that book, if you go straight to Chrissy's website, uh, you can buy it direct from there, and then you can get a personalized copy, I believe. Um, and a couple of years ago, um, you started to live in a van, I believe, as well, which is, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, are you still living in a van? Actually, as of last night, I had my, I was able to purchase a home oh. and as of last night was my first night on a match air mattress on the floor inside a home. So I say that I bought PD a home. So she has a place to grow old now. Fantastic. And the van, the van can go back to being what I had originally purchased it for was to be an adventure vehicle, yeah, yeah, not yeah. a home. <laughs> it <laughs> served an amazing purpose. We lived in the van for 20 months Brilliant. while I, I did that, uh, the home search and it feels like it's paid off and it's been a, Oh, it was quite a learning experience. We'll say that <laughs> doing imagine. the van life. I can imagine. So recently you came over to Scotland, uh, I believe. So t t tell me about that. What, how long were you here? Where did you go? What did you see? Oh my gosh, what a dream come true. And li that's actually really funny. Literally a dream come true. I went for a run with a dear friend and she mentioned that she'd hiked the West Highland Way. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that's incredible. And there's actually a little bit more serendipity to it. The orientation in my dream was, was flipped. And I wrote a blog about it if people want more of the specifics, but it ended up boiling down to a goosebump moment of, I thought the trail was supposed to be on the east side of the country. My friend told me about the west side. I got a copy of the map and it was laying in my bed. And I was like, this doesn't even look like what I was seeing in my dream. Uh -huh. And then the map rotated. I like threw it aside and it rotated. So upside down. So now the trail would be in the correct location. It, it was total goosebump moment of how it came to be that to hike the West Highland way. So I turned 44 this year and I'm known for like making a big deal on my birthday, right? whether it's throwing a lip sync battle for my 40th or jumping out of a plane for my 43rd. Excellent. So I decided to go join some really dear friends that are amazing through hikers. They've done incredible. If you, somebody you want to chat with, they've done the great Himalayan trail this summer. They did the Pacific Northwest trail. They've done the GR20. They've just done a ton of fast packing. Yeah. So I 
they were in Europe and wanted to see Scotland. And through, so through conversations against serendipitous synchronistic moments, we team, uh, landed in Edinburgh together and then made our way up to um, Glasgow and then Mulgai and then walked our way to Fort William. So it was, it was brilliant. Yeah, actually really funny story from the end of it was my girlfriend and I are a little bit faster than her husband. Uh-huh. And on the last day we, we had, we did a big day. We did it in four and a half days. And so on the last day we did, um, 27 miles and we got into town, got showers, found the bed and breakfast, like had dinner ready for when, when, um, John got there. And he told the story when he was coming into town, like kind of gimping along and, um, somebody came up to him and said, you did it in less than eight days. Didn't you? He goes, yeah. He goes, how can you tell? He's like, nobody should do it in less than eight days <laughs> so, it was pretty funny yeah. so. i've actually got a t-shirt on for it's the highland <gasps> fling so that's the oh. first half. that's middle guy to tindrum okay very yeah. cool yeah. yeah i know there's a hundred mile race yeah the yeah the, the, the just the whole way yeah mm-hmm. it was yeah i'd like to do that. that yeah i would yeah i would love to come back and i love i have this thing with doing seeing a trail like I did the FKT on the Tahoe Rim Trail and first I hiked it in six days and then I went back and set the FKT that was in 2015 and that like double experience of like really taking it in and and, like knowing it and then trying to go fast on it there's something pretty key to both experiences that make it feel full and I like doing it that way. I think that's a good way to do it. So that big, so often you'll go somewhere mm. and, and do a new, new event or a new race and you won't see lots of the, the surroundings right. because you're too busy looking at the trail in front of you. So, mm-hmm. so doing it your way, that, that has certainly does have an appeal to it. The last day we got the best weather day, which okay. I just said, thanks, Grams. Thanks, Grandma, for, you know, yeah. sending us good weather to finish on. And it was yeah. still like, we didn't have the winds we'd been dealing with. It was dry. The, it was beautiful. That's a lot of that section was more like military road. So yes. it was pretty easy miles. Yeah. yeah. The, the move, bit, move, uh, move along side, miles. The bit uh, going along Loch Lomond, that gets quite techy underfoot, doesn't it? Oh, it was so, and especially I'm not used to carrying a pack. Right. So being underweight, over that technical stuff, it's a, it's that much more tricky. Like your your stabilizer muscles are stabilizing that pack as well yeah. as working against the train or with the train, and that was definitely noticeable. Yeah. So, did you go anywhere else in Scotland, or did you just do the West Highland Way? We did. We had, I think it was four days once we finished the West Highland Way, and we stayed in Fort William for three days, which was lovely to just stop and yeah. really get to like hang out in, in Fort William and try a couple of different restaurants. And we even went to um, see a movie at the little theater that's right there, just kind of okay. took, took a pause. Yeah. And then we did four days out on um, Isle of the Sky. Okay. Awesome. Which was also lovely. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully the weather was okay mm-hmm. for you there. Oh, a little bit of both, but yeah. we did get some sun breaks and we did old man's store. Good. I didn't really mean this to be just a, a chat about Scotland, but seeing as though you've just been fairly close to where I am. Oh, I was just and I loved it. I think you yeah. were. Well, yeah. I am Scottish. Are you? It, yeah. Well, my grandmother in, immigrated from Scotland when she was one year old. Okay. Awesome. So I, so we did go up to um, Dunfermline yeah. and I found my family's grave. Uh, big tombstone and everything so that was I was a cool I had never done that I've traveled the world and I'd never gone to find like familial grounds and stuff so that was pretty special yeah, way to start the trip so yeah. you know t- 2003 and that's that's a race close to your home isn't it or basically based at, at your home is that why it's a special race to you mm-hmm. and it was my first ultra yeah Mm -hmm. tell me something about it because i've researched a fair few different runners and chatted to different people and chucking up 50k comes up quite often so that's awesome what what's what is it about this race apart from it being your local race i don't know the profile is it good for beginners experts is it technical can you Mm. tell us something about the, the race yeah it's got a little bit of everything because the first 10k and last 10k are along the inner urban 
which are pretty, it's a double track, a car could drive on it, but it's, okay. it's mostly like a dirt track that parallels truck and a drive. It's mostly fat. There's flat. There's about a 500 elevate 500 foot yeah. elevation gain. So pretty relatively flat. It's the middle 18 where you see a bit more of the area and that's in the Chuckanut Mountains right. and you're on Chuckanut Mountain, I should say. And you climb up by Fragrance Lake and you get up on the ridge, which is pretty iconic section because you're literally on a ridge. And it's then quite exposed, lot, is it? It is. It's not. I mean, it's very safe. Right. There's a couple spots right. where like just don't get too close. But it's it's not like knife ridges like I've done in Europe. So it was okay. it's real it's very safe, I think, compared in comparison. Yeah. And then um we've got the mud of like Lost Lake and down down you get up down low and it's there's some muddy sections. And then we have little chin scraper, which is named for the it's the steepest climb on the course. But there's a climb on the Wasatch Front 100 that was called Chin Scraper because of how steep it was. So we have the the little chin scraper. And then a three mile descent and then that same six miles back to uh, Bellingham along the inner urban. So it's really fun to see how like a road runner's skill set plays out and a yeah. like a technical trail runner's skill set plays out. Yeah. And yeah. do you have legs to turn over and run the six miles flat back at the finish? And what's really, I think, entertaining is like that really applies to wherever you are in the field, like a mid pack runner and an elite and the very last person are all battling what it is to find leg turnover yeah. in the last six miles of a 50 K or the last 10 K of a 50 K. Yeah. And did you pace yourself? Right. Did you feel right? You know, three mile descent and feel amazing. And then that last 10 K could cost you, it could take you an hour, which would be a great time, or it could take you two or three hours if you end up walking the whole thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it can, it can change your race in that last little bit. I can imagine. How, how has it grown over the years? Has it, has it gone from a small numbers to, do you cap the numbers on it or? We do. We filled 600 spots in 36 hours this year. Okay. Um, and the race, like when I first ran it in 2000, and then again in 2003, like you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, yeah. um, it was like, I think 60 people that were there at the run to run it. And the race director would sit in the back of his truck with a clipboard and write your time down as you cross the across the finish line right. and now right. like over the years we've done online registration we have chip timing we've brought in uh, food trucks my mom used to make so you know speed up a little bit in the first couple of years my mom would make like a burrito bar for everybody we did hamburgers my parents grilling everything for people um what there's some other fun my friends would come and write times down and like They'd have plastic sheets covering the papers because it's raining in March. So I've lived all over and I just moved back to Bellingham in 2015. Right. I've been race directing for 20 years. So right. I've been away more than I've been here as race director. And I remember when I first moved back, nobody knew who put on the Chuck and at 50 K. They just called it the Bellingham 50 K. There is no myself here. People like, Oh, you're the one. That, <laughs> so they just kind of like they'd sign up and show up and help and be there or come cheer their friends on. Everybody knows somebody that's run the check-in at 50K at some point or another. And I think, and it's a classic. It's one of the oldest races. It's been around for 30 years. Yeah. And so it's one of the oldest races in the state. And so it's got that kind of draw, I think, yeah. internationally too, that's something that's still around this many years later. And you had a virtual edition the past year or two, did you? Is that mm. still going ahead or are you going to do that as well oh. or do you just, just do the actual race? We did keep the, so in 2020, the pandemic shut us down 10 days prior to race. So we had everything ready, like the everything, orders, porta potties, everything was like queued up, ready to go. Yeah. So we just spent a lot, we spent a lot of time canceling and, refunding and getting refunded. And that was a, that was a brutal, like really heartbreaking year personally. Yeah, yeah. And then the next year we planned to, to do virtual because we were just, people were just starting to be vaccinated and yeah. our community has been very conservative on how we come back from the pandemic. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely appreciate and want to honor that. And so we did the virtual event and then 
because of what we created, we created this segment competition where you break the course into segments. We made a lot out of the virtual best we could. Yeah. And so we have those segments available so people can still do that. Yeah. Um, but we found that people are just way more interested in coming back together. So yeah, we're, they, they we're just really be looking forward to that too. Socializing together and be racing and chatting on the race, don't they? Totally. Totally. Well, it's good. It's good. It's back. And you've only got a matter of weeks before it's back on again. So I'm sure it'll all go mm-hmm. smoothly mm-hmm. this year. Back back to normal. Hopefully. I sure hope so. Yeah, yeah, hope so. We're put well, I mean, there's no back to normal, right? We we've been impacted by this. So yeah. there'll be we will have understandable um caution and changes made based on based on what we've been through. But So I've had a few people uh, message me with some questions that they, they'd like me to ask you. Hmm. So one of the questions was nutrition. So I know nutrition hmm. is a subject folk could talk about for, for hours and end, but do you have any, any tips on how long did it take you to, to get nutrition nailed? Um, did, yeah. it, did you get it sorted straight away? Or what, how do you go about your nutrition? <laughs> Uh, I think it's a great, yeah, like you said, this can go in so many different directions, yeah, right? And can yeah. could be its own days exactly. long seminar if somebody wanted. Um, I guess the, I won't call it super quick answer, but the summarized answer is that I can eat. I have got amazing, it's my running superpower that I can eat and eat whatever. And I've definitely made sure that that stayed as a <clears throat> a reality for me. Yeah. And I think that comes from how I also fuel in my day to day. It doesn't just magically turn on when I go run a race or go do a training run. I have to be well fueled all the time. Do you have a strict thing on when you start you every 20 minutes, you'll have a bite to eat or is it just as your body feels it's right? So when out running, I actually try to fuel every 20 to 30 minutes with at least hundred calories, whatever that looks like. It could be chips. It could be a gel. It could be half a bar. It could be a sleeve of ch- um, cliff box or honey stingers or any kind of chew, chew things. I have found um, a big thing that I've noticed in now in my third decade of doing this is that as a, um, my body's changing. I'm a female, like I'm 44 years old. So I don't do sugar as well as I used to. I could just down carbohydrates, like nobody's business. And I feel like I can do that. I just don't feel as good. So by tuning in and paying attention to what helps me feel good, I do better with denser calories that have some fat or protein to them. So like cheese sticks or meat. I like, that's what we did on the West Highland way was a lot of like protein based granted. We weren't moving as fast. We had longer days out, but my body tends to feel and function better when I'm not just burning high, like the quick carbohydrate burning. Yeah. 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 So March, 2016, you wrote an article about foam rolling. Um, is that something you, you do religiously? Do you do it before mm. running, uh, post running? It's, it's, how, how important do you find foam rolling? Do you use massage guns at all? Mm. I am a big believer in it. And I am also a very realistic, like I get it when people say, when do I have time? Yeah. We all have time. Find that I do really well with vibrations. So with the ProTech is the brand that I work with. ProTech Athletics have the Orb Extreme and it has a vibrating component to it. And so vibration is different than palpation. Right. So just vibrating in the muscle. And that one I use quite a bit. And then the long, um, the big foam roller are my two like tools of choice, if you will. But I could be way better. Like I'm very, very admitting of they sit there and some... Sometimes I'm like, I have to leave them in the middle of the floor to make sure I'll still step over. I'm like, sit yeah. down and use the foam roller. Yeah, yeah. The great thing about it is like 30 seconds on a muscle group is enough. Like we don't need to sit there and watch a half hour show and foam roll the whole time. Okay. We can do what we need to do in three minutes. And it's like, yes, we have three minutes. Like we can do that. Like while we're brushing our teeth or something, or you could do it, but 
we just, we need to program like um, stacking habits. Yeah. Home rolling, I think is one of those things. If you just stack it, you would do it and you would feel so much better. Yeah. And I, I do yeah. notice as I get older, I have to do it more. So then the things that trigger me to get down on the floor and do it mm -hmm. are more frequent. So I am doing it more. I could be better. <laughs> yeah. 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 I always feel better if I do it, but I just don't do it anywhere near mm -hmm. enough. But I'm sure that's mm -hmm. the same for most people. It is, as you say, it's just making it a habit, a routine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How, how have you coped uh, in the past with dark moments during runs? So like, have you had, it's like, have you hallucinated when you've been mm. out running? So can you tell me about um, some of those kind of moments, how you've got through them? Well, hallucinations are fun in my world. <laughs> <laughs> There have been some interesting ones. There was a scary one in Africa. I did the auto elephant 100 and the last, I don't know, maybe 20 miles to go. I, they put us out of the elephant park because there had been black rhino activity. Right. And so I think there was a lot playing in my brain of like what I was, you know, seeing and where I was. And yep. there were, in my mind, there were these crazy, like scary clowns that were like approaching the road that I was running on. Uh -huh. And I looked at them, I was blinking. I could not get them to go away. And I actually changed sides of the road and ran so I could be further away from them. So convinced that there were these scary clowns. But I, I mean, I think I wasn't so convinced. I knew I was hallucinating, but I could not, not see it. It was really kind of creepy in a way, but like, it's just what hallucinations are. But I always find them entertaining, but I think I've been lucid enough to know that they were hallucinations. Yeah, yeah. Not, they didn't totally take over my mind. Yeah. I do daily meditation and for the last three years, and that's been a very helpful like component and whether it's through, I think I've like always meditated as long as I've been a runner. I just didn't know what I was doing right now. I'm like more conscious and like actually take time to sit and meditate. Yeah. And I think that is, that is like a helpful understanding of why our heads do what they do and what's, what spaces we can get into. We call it a dark space or other like joyful space or whatever, by being in, be, bleh, by being still, mm -hmm. I can understand why my brain's doing that. And it doesn't, it's n so far, it's not as heavy. It can still feel really dark, yeah, but yeah. I can, I can understand why right. and then figure out um, how to accept it and then know that it'll change. I might buy the one, the hard lesson for me was to learn like, well, I've accepted it. It should go away now. And that's not always, <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. Yeah. You have to like trust that it will change and do things for yourself to help it change. Yeah. But just, just acceptance alone doesn't get it uh, totally out of there. <laughs> Um, so you, you've traveled uh, all over the world, raced all over the place. Is there anywhere that stands out to you? Any uh, number of places that you'd love to go back to? Or mm. where's been your favorite places to, to run and travel to? You know, the funny thing is, is the my favorite places to, I, I haven't raced yet, are Scotland and New Zealand. Okay. And I've loved You're both of them. Similar. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And actually, and also very similar to the Pacific Northwest, okay. like they okay. all three kind of have a vibe that is very familiar, I think. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, I've got to, I've got to repeat and go back to countries like China and Japan and Africa to, uh, race or, um, continents, I guess, not just, just countries there, but, um, I feel like for like locations that I just, my heart is drawn to, yep. there wasn't a race association. It was um, just the adventure aspect that I got to have yep. both in New Zealand and Scotland. Okay. Okay. No, it's good. Well, it'd be great to get you back mm. to Scotland and for you to enter. There's a fair few different races here. The West Highland Way is the, the obvious big long one, but there's, there's plenty great. of other ones as well. Mm -hmm. it's a big place that so you, you need to explore different areas i need to see more yes yeah. for sure but we all do it's a, you can't fit everything in can we yep uh yeah that's been the crazy part about traveling the world and doing all these races yeah is and i i think was a silver lining to the pandemic was 
I have the North Cascades, which is a national park that people come from all over the world to explore that I have barely stepped foot in until the pandemic. And and I have Olympic National Park out on the peninsula. These are like destination spots that I could be in in a couple hours, but I'll travel, you know, a 40 hour flight to New Zealand (laughs) to go explore. So I think that was a good reminder of like, we have a lot in our in our immediate proximity, we, for, and not everybody, but for those of us that have chosen to live in areas that are surrounded by mountains and water. Yeah. L- lots of people did that with the pandemic. They, they, <sighs> they were all exploring little trails and paths close to their homes that they would never yeah. normally go on. So yeah, it have some minor plus sides. Mm-hmm. Yep. We got to look for them there, but they're yeah. there. So you recently wrote an article about how to embrace getting older. Um, please help me. How do you <laughs> embrace getting older? I feel like I've aged 10 years in the past two years. Mm. So what's the secret? Can you, can you help us out there? Oh, I don't know if it's any secret, but I feel like the mindfulness has been a really helpful addition to yeah. my life. Like I said, I think it's always been there in some form, but just not consciously. And now it's a much more conscious decision. Um, I think a big one is not competing with your younger self. We should, we shouldn't compete with anybody else, right? We should only like work with who we are and who we are is who we are right now. Yeah. And what we did, you know, running the grand slam at 27, I'm not like, I'm almost 20 years after that. Yeah. Like it's not going to be the same. It could be a faster time who knows, but it's not going to be the same. So don't compete yeah. with the previous version of yourself be with just right where you are right now and then adapting like i think fuel like we talked about with nutrition that's yep. been an interesting to one interesting one knowing and witnessing how what i need and use in my 40s is very different than my 20s and even 30s so just don't say just because i've always done it like i have to keep doing it this way mm-hmm. like be really present with who who and where your body are is and are now yeah, yeah, things things definitely change, but you could go, still go back and do the the same events you did twenty years ago. You would just experience it differently, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. It'd be boring if it was always the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, so, do you still get the same excitement at the start of a race? I know you race less than you used to, but do you, do you still get the same buzz being on a on a start line, or how, how has that changed over the years? You know, I think we need to do a follow-up interview because I did my last race, um, March of 2018. Okay. I ran the Gao Li Gong 165 kilometer race in China. Right. Yeah. And it was a spectacle. Like the guy that announced the Olympics in Beijing announced our race and there were like fireworks and laser lights. And I mean, just a scene, mute, loud music announcements, just, and they, and then running a hundred miles, you're out in the wilderness. And then you come back to this, you know, crazy scene. And I yeah. placed the first woman. I was 10th overall, I carried the American flag across this like cur- amazing waterway that man-made waterway that finished in this small village. And I remember they put this big bell around my neck. I've told this story a couple of times yeah. and I just, I had this moment, like I put my head down to receive the bell and I was just like, that's it. I'm done. Like, and I was 40 years old. I'd raced for two decades at a yeah. high level. Yeah. And I just like, felt like it was the mic drop moment. Like I'm done. And it was really peaceful. Right. And the, you know, the governor was there and of the local village and like media people are asking like, are you coming back next year? And I just didn't have the, I just, I said, I don't know. Cause I really was like, I don't think I'm racing again. Like, I think I'm really done. Right. And, and it felt really good. And then I thought, oh, you know, two months from now, a month from now, once I'm not as tired, I'll be signing up for another race. And four years went by. Right. Okay. So I have not, yeah, that feeling didn't come back um, until I think COVID um, and being in the pandemic and not having the option Yeah, yeah. and really like, missing because I was started just showing up as vol- as a volunteer. I just be at aid stations and volunteer or be at the start line or mark courses for people. And I was, I was getting what I wanted out of it at that point, just, you know, just enough to like touch into the community, 
but I didn't have to stand on the starting line. Yeah. And then that was all stopped for that um, segment of time. And as we kind of were starting to come back, our local event called the Tiger Claw, it's a 26 mile race that has like 8,000 feet of gain. So right. about a little shy of 3,000 meters of gain yeah. in less than 50K. And I decided to run it and I had so much fun. And it wasn't about competition or anything. It was just getting back and being with the community. Yeah. So I have started signing up for races again. I'm signed up for the Miwok 100K in nice. May. And I'm just really curious to see what it's like in yeah. this body that's four years post competitive racing, but 25 years into running yeah. long distances. Like, so I don't have your answer, but that's the no, reason why I don't have no, your that's answer. <laughs> that would be great, though, you going back to doing me walk again and just experience, experiencing it differently than, than you have done previously. I loved being competitive. I loved, like, you know, I was running faster because there was somebody else there. Like, I feel like that can still be a part of it. I yeah. might not be on the podium anymore, uh -huh. but, like, I can still enjoy being out there with the community. And enjoying it doesn't mean you're not pushing yourself. Like, the mid-packer that's enjoying it, they're still pushing themselves. The back of the packer that's chasing cutoffs, they're really pushing themselves. But they're as long as there's, I try and coach the clients that I work with that like, however you want to race, like, yeah. but like, as long as there's joy. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're, you're quite um, smiling and being happy during a race is a big thing for you, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. We choose to do our bodies. Let us do this. <laughs> yeah. I've, I, I feel like that's such a privilege. And you touched on your coaching there. So like, um, that's a big part of your life now, isn't it? Uh, coaching clients and what, what sort of advice have you got for people? If somebody was to look to get a coach, what would they expect? What, what kind of improvements or what do you give to someone as being a coach? Hmm. I, if, if I heard a more general question and I, I would tell the client or the person that's looking for a coach to figure out what they want and they it's lovely because now you can find it. When I got into this sport, coaching was not, there was no coaches for ultra distance runners. Yeah. Um, so, but now there's such a, a wide breadth of people that have various things to offer in terms of experience, training, uh, how many clients they've worked with, how long they've been coaching, um, you know, somebody that knows your area, like a coach that can meet with you in person versus yeah. is, 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 you know, being online okay. So I would, to advise the person to like kind of clue in on a couple of bullet points that are really strong with them. Yep. And then whenever somebody reaches out to me, I always want to chat first and yeah. make sure that we are a good matchup yep. and what goals they're shooting for are something that I can be helpful towards. And like my approach with, with clients, does that work for that person? And I know my client is typically somebody that's and my book is the total title when your first ultra, like I tend to gravitate towards people that are just getting in the sport okay. as opposed to somebody that wants to set a 50 mile PR. Like if it's their first 50 mile, then it's going to be a PR. Could you give some advice to folk out there for a couple of like exercises that they could do at home that's going to improve their running? What if you could just pick uh, mm. two or three different things, um, which anyone could do, they don't need to join a gym. W what sort of things may improve their running? I would say like rolling out your feet and calves. So okay. like standing or using, using a, about the size of a tennis ball, a golf ball is a little intense, Yeah, yeah. about yeah. the size of a tennis ball for and a tennis ball might actually just work. Uh, but rolling out your feet and then hitting some of the trigger points on your calves, we tend to get really tight mm -hmm. as runners and just some of that fascial release can really end up helping the whole body. And then I'm now, I've always been the person that like gets out of the car and starts running or like I'm sitting here in my office in my running clothes for three hours. And then I finally like just get up and go out the door. Yeah. And I, the big adjustment I've had to do is actually do some activation exercises before I go again, it takes two or three minutes and either like just some knee hugs, some leg swings, some air squats 
and um, walking quad stretches and my run from the get-go feels that much better yeah. than rather than having just like jumped up from the chair. So, and then giving your body the same on the other end too, to, to just keep things limber and moving and not like locked in these 90 degree positions that we put ourselves in by driving cars and sitting at desks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, th thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much for that everything there um everyone can find you on you're on instagram aren't you um you've got your own yep. website uh and you're on twitter as well anywhere else anyone can find you i don't really do twitter anymore but if you nope. if you know how to spell my name you can find me my email is linked to my website and everything yeah, yeah, and yeah. instagram Perfect. yeah yeah okay. thanks okay.